Welcome. My name is Gary Wilder. I'm the director of the Committee on Globalization and Social Change at the Graduate Center. And I'm just extremely excited uh, to be hosting this event. Credit for the event goes to Jessica Turner at Verso, who uh, assembled this amazing group of people to do just the kind of thing we try to do uh, all the time. So I'm very happy to have everyone here. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists briefly and say a little bit about the format. Maybe I'll start with the format. Um, well, no. I'll... So let me talk about who is here. Um, in order, May Bouvi is all the way uh, on the left. She's executive director and co-founder of 350.org, an international climate change campaign uh, and grassroots movement. She is also the co-author of Fight Global Warming Now. Um, Anna Galkina and James Marriott, who are there in the middle, are both uh, uh, members and uh, involved in uh, Platform, a London-based arts, human rights, and environmental justice organization focusing on the fossil fuel industry. Anna Galkin is the research assistant there, and uh, she has investigated oil-related corruption in Central Asia for Global Witness. And James is the, uh, as well as being an artist, naturalist, active, and activist, he's a co-author of The Oil Road and The Next Gulf, London, Washington, and the oil conflict in Nigeria. And to my left is Timothy Mitchell, who uh, personally I'm especially excited to have here only because uh, at each stage of my academic life, he seemed to be textually hovering, we haven't met until five seconds ago, but, but, but ho hovering on the horizon. When I was a graduate student, we were organizing reading groups around colonizing Egypt. When I started teaching, I was immediately teaching rule of experts, and it was an important reference point for the work I was doing on the colonial state. And now uh, carbon democracy has become an indispensable reference point for the best graduate students here at the Graduate Center. It's really kind of working its way into so many important conversations. And this kind of conversation between academics, activists, uh, uh, organizers, and artists, and think public thinkers is just the kind of thing uh, we like to do. There's much to say about all of their work, but I'll just uh, end this very brief introduction by saying that at, you know, at the end of Carbon Democracy, uh, Tim asks a crucial question, what kind of politics might follow from the end of the fossil fuel era, and what forms of collective life might be possible and des desirable in relation to that. So it's just that kind of close, close focus on the technological, the natural, the material, uh, the infrastructural, and kind of linking that to basic political questions about uh, democracy, or as he says, uh, re-democratizing re the forms of democracy. And I think that's kind of the spirit of this conversation. So uh, in terms of the format, I believe everyone's going to speak for, uh, May is going to do an introduction. And everyone's going to speak for a few minutes, 10 minutes maybe. And then uh, Anna will moderate a kind of uh, Q&A. May will moderate a Q&A. So. <laughs> you got it. May will moderate a Q&A uh, discussion with the audience. And it will be very interactive. And that's the idea. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Uh, it's very good to be here at CUNY, and I think you're in for a really fun conversation. I don't know if any of you heard, but many of our, all of our guests were on Democracy Now! a few days ago. Did anybody hear that program? And they were fantastic, so I really felt like I had to up my game to moderate on this panel. Um, but, um, and the other fun connection I want to make sure everyone knows is 350.org and Verso share office space in Brooklyn. So it's this nice coming together of, uh, of partners. So it should be a lively discussion. Um, and if you see me playing with my phone, it's just so I can be a good timekeeper. So with that, uh, we're going to first hear from you, James to help set the, set the stage for this evening's conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks very much indeed, May. And I'd like also particularly to thank the other people who've helped put this together, Jessica, as was mentioned, and Gary, and the other folks at Verso, and also Tom Cruiser. Um, just to say a little bit momentarily about platform, I mean, uh, 
uh, we're part of a, I work as part of a collective, there's 13 of us at currently, and what we do is we bring together the arts, activism, education, and research, combining those four different spheres or disciplines to create projects which are engaged in social and ecological justice. It, the collectivity of that, of that process is embodied in this book because although it's got two authors on the front of it, it's really the creation of a whole set of people, both who work for Platform and also the NGOs and activists and people in the frontline communities that we've worked with over the years. The book started as a research exploration in 1998 um, and, and slowly evolved into uh, a campaign, which we did with a whole set of other um, activists and uh, campaigners, and then eventually we took the, took the form of, of a book. The principle and the idea behind the book is to try to place in the mind of the reader a sense of the physical geography of what a pipeline constitutes, um, what this journey between uh, one space of production and another place of consumption actually is like, what it's physically like. So the book is, uh, uh, is the, the passage of two people, essentially, going from the source to the place of consumption. But it also cuts away constantly to the other uh, places that create that process of production and consumption, namely the centers of power in terms of the city of London, but also Washington and other uh, locations such as Brussels. And it's that cutting back and forward, it is for us, is the essence of this, trying to understand the relationship between what is called center and what it might be called periphery, between the places of decision-making and the places of the impact of that decision-making. And at the same time, we also try to explore the long history of this oil road, um, because the journey that it makes is a journey that's uh, uh, been undertaken for the, since the 1870s, when oil was first produced in Baku and slowly moved um, out, out from that area in, in Azerbaijan to or what is, it was then the Russian Caucasus, Transcaucasian Rep uh, Republic, uh, to, uh, to the places of consumption in Europe particularly. And we explore that long history and how oil has underpinned the development of political movements, social movements, modernity itself in Europe, which links for us absolutely to uh, Tim's work about the relationship of uh, carbon to democracy and carbon to other social movements. But it also hopefully explores the questions of how do we go beyond the oil road, not just the physical road, but also the kind of uh, cultural and uh, political structure of that road. How do we move beyond the oil road into a space beyond it, which is what uh, Gary referred to and, of course, is integral to the work that May does. The journey, to be more specific, I don't know if you can see this, it might be a slide yep. of, the, of the map there. Oh yeah, if you can see that one, uh, you're clever. We've been having a little bit of technology challenges here, but for those of you who can see it, I'll, uh, I'll explain it, and those of you who can't see it, you just have to close your eyes and imagine. Basically, the, um, the journey that we take and the, the journey that the oil takes in this instance is from the Caspian Sea Deep beneath the Caspian Sea, on the western side of the Caspian Sea, offshore of Azerbaijan, oil is drilled from five kilometers beneath the seabed. It's pumped up into an um, oil platform and then pumped 147 kilometers along the seabed to, to a terminal at, at, at Sangachal on the western side of the uh, Caspian Sea. From there, it's pumped through deserts and fields, forests and villages, towns, and eventually to the port of Jehan, which is on the southeastern corner of Turkey, at the Mediterranean southeastern corner of Turkey, near where we think of being Syria being. At that point, it's put onto ta oil tankers, and it's distributed around the world. It could indeed come to places such as here, New York, or at least the refineries in the proximity from here. But a vast majority of it, about 48% in any average week, turns uh, travels across the Mediterranean and goes up the Adriatic to, to Trieste near Venice. From there, it's having been pumped over one set of mountains, some of the highest in the Europe, European uh, continent, is then pumped over another set of mountains. It goes through a pipeline through it northern Italy, through the Austrian Alps, and down into southern Germany. And in southern Germany, there's another set of distribution pipelines which take it to eight refineries in southern Germany, uh, Czech Republic and Austria. 
At that point, of course, it's like all products which all of you know about, it's turned into anything from asphalt to jet fuel. And it may be then burnt in a whole set of different combustion engines from a bus to the, uh, the, the, engine, the, engine, the, the turbines of a 747 that might take off from Munich Airport, for example, and fly towards New York. As it does so, that, uh, that um, jet engine will rise several kilometers into the sky. What interests us, and we try to explore in the, pipeline, in the story, is that this, what has happened is that matter, carbon, has moved from five kilometers beneath the seabed to several kilometers in the air. And it's, all it's done is it's been traversed across the Earth. It's moved from the lithosphere to the atmosphere. And it takes, on average, 22 days. It took about four million years ago that oil was laid down, and in a split second it's burnt in the, in the combustion engine of that jet plane in tw a space of 22 days. So essentially all this structure is doing is moving that matter from A to B, from underneath the ground and into the sky. But it's also doing something else which is extremely important. It's generating a return on capital. It's only because it's seen as a structure of capital uh, reproduction that this thing exists. As we say repeatedly in our work, if BP, in this instance, which is the driving company behind it, they're not interested in oil. They're only interested in capital. They're only interested in return on capital. If they could make their money from shoes or spaghetti and more money from that, that's what they do. But in this instance, they can make it out of oil, and that's why they do what they do. If they couldn't make money out of it, they wouldn't do it. And that's one of the key things to explore. And of course, the reason why they make the money out of it, the way in which they make the money out of it, interacts with a whole set of political uh, um, drivers, which I'm sure both my colleague Anna and um, Tim would link, link to. Um, just before I hand over, I'd like to read a, a short passage um, from the book mainly because I'd like to try and put into your heads a sense of that place, that geography. Because as I say, as I repeat, the point from us and the reason for writing it as a travel book is the fact that we want people to go away from the, reading this book and go, I can see this place. It's in my head. The film is running in my head. I can actually see this country, which is in a way a state within a state. So I'm going to read a short little passage from this place to give you a sense of it. Uh, maybe I'll... What if I, if I stand up, can I, can I move this thing? You can use Ooh. the lecture. Yep, that's good. <laughs> Hold on. That's better. And this, is, this takes place um, in a village called Yelachi in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the southeast corner of, of Turkey. So, we drive south the next day. The mountains to our east are tipped with light, glowing just before sunrise. As dawn, a dawn breeze is slowly dispersing the sh last shreds of mist on the peaks around us. Hawks soar in the moist, warm wind that has climbed from Turkey's southern coast up the slopes of the Taurus. These mountains are the last link of the great chain that stretches across Asia, spreading from the Himalayas. A blanket of Taurus pine Cedar and oak covers the steep hillsides and deep valleys with the occasional red-brown crags, limestone precipices, and plunging waterfalls breaking the dense forests. On the flat land high between the peaks, the villages work the red earth. When it rains, this fertile soil turns to thick, sticky mud. On a wet night in July 2004, 11-year-old Kulibai and Nurula failed to return to their parents' home in Yelachi. Many of the village's 150 families turned out to search for them. An eight-year-old friend of the boys said that he'd seen them playing near the open, flooded pipeline trench earlier in the day. Ray Cooper, the acting site manager, was phoned about the missing children that evening at 9 p.m., he rang various officials working for BP and another Turkish company, Limak, the construction subcontractor. And then he set up a crisis center at the distant workers' camp. An excavator and pumping equipment were sent to Yelachi, and the search quickly focused on a particular ditch that was gradually drained. 
Once Cooper realized that the children could have drowned on the construction site, he requested that the gendarme military police give protection to his work workforce. Finally, just before midnight, two small bodies were pulled from the water, still clothed. Company staff had already gone, the ditch having been excavated, once being evacuated, once it seemed likely that the boys had died. Photographs seen later of a digger with its cab windows smashed suggest why. How had these, these deaths happened? What had made this happen? Heavy rains the week before had caused a stream diverted by construction to swell. Slipshod planning meant that the water flooded the uncovered pipeline trench, which, dug a month previously, had been left unfilled. The children of Yelach had been playing around the construction site since work began, but this new two-meter deep pool provided a more exciting playground. Erosion from the wind and the rain widened the trench as the sides collapsed. A photograph taken by a BP health and safety officer on the 7th of July shows two boys in swimming trunks standing on the pipeline next to the flooded trench. Their names are not recorded. Two days later, Nurula and Kulebai found a wooden pallet by the pipes and dragged it to the site to use as a raft. Once on the water, their makeshift boat could not hold them. The trench's steep, high sides meant the boys were in a death trap. We have driven all day to return to Yelechi, and the air is, of the wet evening is filled with the scent of thyme and marjoram. Near the middle of the village, a line of tall poplars provides scant cover from the downpour. Our boots are overwhelmed by the red mud flowing down the road, so we take shelter in a barn. The smell of greased farm machinery mingles with that of nearby animals. We have arranged to meet several villagers who now join us in the barn to escape the rain. Still angry, they explain how, once the bodies were returned to the families and the site was cleaned up, BP and Limac denied all responsibility for the boy's death. The two bereaved families were forced into a protracted court battle in search of some level of recognition and justice. Only in 2007 did the companies accept liability of a limited nature and settled out of court. Yet the company's internal investigation reports, which he obtained through freedom of information requests and brought with us, show that they fully understood their responsibility. Memos describe how, a month before the accident, the site was already attractive to village children who persistently play around the trench. The Limac environmental officer had several times raised her concerns that the trench sides could collapse on top of the children. The internal investigation made attempts to divert blame onto the villagers. They asserted that parents did not know where their children were and that the children did not heed previous warnings. But the documents reveal that the project's own safety procedures were not enforced, that the required barrier of posts and tape was not properly erected. They also raised questions over whether there were lessons learned by the companies after a child was crushed by a pipe further up the line beyond Erzurum the previous autumn. Bishopsgate in London. Five days after Kulibai and Nurullah had drowned, BP's finance manager, John Wingate, wrote a letter to the French bank, Société Générale the coordinator of the lending group of institutions helping to fund the pipeline. It stated as follows. We regret to inform you of the drowning of two children on the BTC project in Turkey. Someone in, someone in Sokgen then made 14 A4 copies and forwarded these on to other lenders in Europe, Japan and US. One of these copies was sent to Babu Abba at the Royal Bank of Scotland on the top floor of 135 Bishopsgate in the city of London. Abba was then an associate director of RBS, which had the largest oil and gas banking division in the UK. On the day the letter arrived, this division, overseen by Steve Mills, was engaged in projects across the world. Mills might have been assessing the reasonable returns for an Exxon offshore oil field in Nigerian waters, while his deputy, Colin Bowsfield, admitted, submitted a, a bid to finance the Angolan state company. Maybe advice specialist 
Michael Crossland was working on a loan agreement made between Qatar Gas 2 projects, which became a reality that year. The global reach of this London office, together with its twins in Houston and Aberdeen, had led RBS to market itself as the oil and gas bank. The BTC pipeline loan was just a small part of its business. Sheltering in the rain in Yelachi, we look at a single sheet of A4 sent from, the Par from Paris five months after the signing of the loan agreement, announcing that the 11-year-olds 11 11 had drowned in the pipeline and that RBS had helped make possible. We find ourselves wondering how ABBA received the news, how he relayed it to the rest of the oil and gas team, and what kinds of connections they felt between the office in Bishopsgate and these muddy fields. Viewed from a desk in London, BTC just becomes one of many industrial projects funded by RBS. Moreover, accidents are bound to happen. And BP was seemingly conducting a thorough investigation of the incident. The internal report clearly laid the blame on the subcontractor, Limac, for not filling in the ditch. But the investigation did not ask whether this slipshod work was partly driven by the pressure on Limac and BP to cut construction costs. That pressure itself was a direct result of the actions taken by BP, alongside Peter Bellinger and Richard Morningstar, to create the terms of what was known as the turnkey agreement. This agreement was crafted to ensure that the financial architecture of the pipeline would attract loans, such as that made by RBS. And it was the private bank's drive for greater profits that helped them form that architecture. This piece of paper, it seems to us, links the boys' deaths to RBS's unit in Baku, in Azerbaijan, to Society Journal in Paris, to RBS in Bishopsgate, and beyond that to the headquarters of BP in St. James's Square in London, and the offices of Bellinger and Morningstar in Ankara. But the reality of Kubilai and Nurullah stuck in the ditch and slowly stinking, sinking fails to break through the dry language of the incident report. Thank you. Um, before I hand it over um, to, oh, I'm going to go next. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, so my name, again, is May Bouvi, and I'm one of the co-founders of 350.org, and we work around the world on climate change, um, which is very connected to this topic, of course, because of our reliance on fossil fuel being the primary driver of climate change. and. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the activist component and the activist imperative of the topics we're discussing tonight. And um, one of the things I wanted to pull out from specifically your work is that in order to be an activist on an issue, you need to be able to visualize what you're confronting. And for a long time, climate change was an issue that people had a very difficult time visualizing. Uh, it felt like it was a issue that would be affecting our lives in 50 years, not today or tomorrow. Uh, it, it felt like an issue that was affecting people on a far distant corner of the globe, um, perhaps in an island like the Maldives, but not here in, say, New York City. And that's all changed. Um, 350.org, we started in 2008 um, in that era where there was still this puzzlement in the climate movement about what this visualization would take and we're now in a completely different space and time. And uh, it's both positive, because here we, here we know what we need to do to confront this issue. We know the industry we have to confront, and we know what makes them vulnerable. So in a certain sense, the roadmap is clear, and all we have to do is take action. On the other hand, part of the reason that the roadmap is so clear is the problem has escalated so quickly. And uh, some of you may have seen a piece in Rolling Stone that appeared about a year ago by uh, 350's co-founder and my colleague, Bill McKibben, and it was called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. Um, and we did a whole tour called Do the Math, which people told us was a terrible title because no one likes math. <laughs> but uh, but it, it reached uh, 22 cities and sold out, so... So some of I'm not a math person, but I guess some people are. But the math is is this: um, the the first point, the first data point in the math is two degrees, two degrees Celsius, and that's the number that scientists say is the limit 
that we should reach in terms of global temperature average, and that above two degrees, the catastrophic effects of climate change are, uh, are reality, that there's not much more we can do. And the other reason two degrees matters is because it's one of the very few globally agreed upon targets by political leaders. And back in 2009, at the UN negotiations in Copenhagen, two degrees C was one of the very few things that was established as some kind of global benchmark. So it matters politically and it matters scientifically. The second number is 565 gigatons of carbon. And that is how much carbon we can still put up in the atmosphere and stay below the two degree threshold. So that's the second number, 565. The third number is 2,795 gigatons of carbon. And that is the amount that the fossil fuel industry has in its reserves ready to burn. And that, that, that is the number that uh, indicates their value on the global market. And so the math matters because it's one of the clearest indications we have yet that the industry has no interest in curbing its behavior in order to avert climate change. And in fact, uh, they're looking for more, more reserves of carbon. Projects like the tar sands in Canada, like fracking in New York, like shale oil um, extraction. These are all examples of not just the current oil and coal reserves, but deeper and deeper into the earth. So we know what we're up against. It's a very powerful industry, and the work of all of these fine people only makes it more clear uh, how much we're gonna have to work to confront their political power. But the good news, as I said at the beginning, is we know what we have to do. And the story of the environmental movement up until recently is not one about uh, confronting corporate power. It, for I think many decades, the environmental movement was characterized by consumer choices. Buy a different light bulb, bike a little bit more, compost sometimes, and somehow we'll make it through this problem. When you start to look at numbers like these, that suddenly makes no sense at all. And fortunately, the movement has changed to confront this new reality. And uh, one of the things that 350 has been working the most on is nonviolent direct action. And how, and using these traditional strategies that have brought down the apartheid regime in South Africa, civil rights movement here in the United States, um, as a way to make it clear how serious the problem of climate change truly is. Because if we say the world is burning and then we say change your light bulb, it doesn't compute. But if people are risking arrest, are going to jail, are putting their uh, whole lives on the line over this issue, it suddenly starts to flip a switch in the public consciousness. And that's what we believe we have to do. Um, the problem is too big to not have a massive social movement confronting it. So that's, that's what we're about. And I'll just mention a couple of opportunities to get involved, uh, which we can talk about more at the end. But one of the best examples of visualizing pipelines right here in the United States is the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, which would run from Alberta, Canada, through the Gulf of Mexico for export. And uh, two years ago, in August of 2011, 1,500 people were arrested at the White House over this project. And when we started down this path, we had no idea exactly what would happen. And our, our gamble was the one I just described, that civil disobedience could be a turning point in the climate movement. And it was. What we didn't realize is that this Keystone project would become our biggest point of leverage on the president of the United States on climate. And that's what it's become. And that's part of why it's so important is um, it's become clear that this project symbolizes all the politics around climate and energy. And if the president doesn't build the pipeline, it would be the first time that a major industrial project would be denied on climate grounds. And that would be one of the most significant political leverage points we have as a movement. So that's why it matters so much. And that's why um, there's ongoing actions. There was a day of action two weeks ago we're gonna be organizing a series of um, basically political education presentations all over the country in the next week or so. So stay tuned for that. Um, but of course, we can't fight this problem one pipeline at a time. There's thousands of pipelines, as 
uh, others here know far better than me. And so how else can we confront this industry if we can't, if we can't meet them everywhere they are? Um, so we started to think at 350 about a, a massive campaign focused on finance and focused on their money, not on the presumption that we can ever bankrupt Exxon. Uh, it's, it's like a laughable idea coming from me that I, somehow we could have a, a role in this. What we can do is bankrupt their ability to corrupt the political process, bankrupt their political and social viability. And that's what's starting to happen through this really exciting divestment campaign that's taking place all over the country and now in Australia, uh, in Europe, and other parts of the world. And here in New York, there's lots and lots of campaigns that students are running to ask their universities to divest their endowments from fossil fuels. The idea being, if it's wrong to profit from fossil fuels because fossil fuels cause climate change, it's wrong to fund our education system on those profits. And so the movement has really caught on. And I don't know, I sent a note to our New York organizer right before this call to see if there was somebody here at CUNY I could direct you all to, but maybe this person is in the audience, I just want to ask. Okay, great, well, perhaps at the end of this talk, one of you will raise your hand and you will be that person. Um, but the divestment campaign is a way to uh, call into question the social license of this industry. And um, it, was a, it was a big gamble when we started, but we're getting good feedback that it's starting to work. And there was just a study that Oxford did a couple of days ago that demonstrated that the economic impact of divestment is hard to prove, which we knew, but the stigmatization, as they called it, the stigmatization impact is the gravest risk that the industry faces. So this is very good news for us. Uh, so we take this as a positive sign that we're on the right track, that through the combination of visualizing the problem through these infrastructure projects, through understanding the math and what's at stake, and then through having a, a systemic challenge to the way the industry is able to operate, we can build this movement and um, have a much better shot at living the next generations to come and something like the planet that we were all born onto. So that's, that's my piece. And um, from here, I want to turn it over to you, Tim, to speak about, or. Yeah, I can, no? I can go first. Yeah. <laughs> However you want right. to do it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thank you. I, before I say stuff, um, do some of the people who are sitting in the back want to uh, take some of the seats that are at the front? Uh, are you comfy over there? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, that's cool. Um, I'm going to take you back a little bit to uh, the... Um, uh, to the pipeline that uh, James started talking about, the Baku Belisi Jehan pipeline, um, and where it starts is in Azerbaijan. Um, and just a little fact from an oil sponsored um, so called democracy uh, that we've heard today Azerbaijan uh, has just had its presidential election today, um, and uh, the uh, the winner of the election has just announced himself, um, it being uh, Ilham Aliyev, uh, who has run the country uh, for the past 12 years, is that right? Um, but uh, him and his father combined have run the country for the past 40 years with a very small uh, gap in the middle of the 90s. Um, a tiny interesting thing that happened this morning was the, for the first time, the government of Azerbaijan um, uh, published a mobile app on which you could follow uh, the results of the election as it was being um, uh, conducted live and um, counted up live. And this morning, um, before the polling stations even closed, uh, the uh, app accidentally released the result of the election. <laughs> Um, the result was that um, the uh, that the current president has won with um, 72.76 percent um, uh, majority. The majority at the close of the election, um, somewhat bizarrely, was even bigger. Um, he he has now actually won with an 85 percent majority. So, so that's a little that's a little introduction to the electoral democratic politics of Azerbaijan. Um, and um, I don't know if you remember, uh, at the end of the piece that uh, James has read, uh, the name Richard Morningstar came up. Um, Richard Morningstar is currently the um, US ambassador to Azerbaijan. And that's him 
on his uh, inauguration uh, day as, as ambassador, uh, bowing to uh, a statue of uh, Haidar Aliyev, uh, the father of Ilham Aliyev. This is something that ambassadors don't tend to do generally, bowing to dictators, but, uh, but there you are. That's a very visual demonstration of um, what uh, the US is willing to do to keep a good relationship with Azerbaijan, um, to keep the oil and now the gas uh, pumping uh, into this pipeline and, um, uh, and up to the world market. Um, the career of uh, Richard Morningstar is pretty interesting. He started out in the um, late 80s and early 90s in the uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is a uh, government-backed um, organization that underwrites um, uh, American corporations operating abroad. And he was absolutely instrumental in uh, the US and its companies breaking into um, the countries of the former Soviet Union. Uh, the U.S. was particularly keen to break Azerbaijan and Georgia and Turkey out of um, the hold of Russian power. And so the uh, pipeline that we're talking about, Baku Tbilisi Jehan, was a geopolitical instrument with which the U.S. Um, enticed these countries and uh, bound these countries into its um, sphere of influence. And uh, Richard Morningstar personally lobbied um, the uh, US government at the time, uh, so that sanctions against Azerbaijan, which were imposed because it was at war with um, Armenia and still is, um, these sanctions would be bypassed uh, in order for this pipeline to be built. Um, so that is a very uh, kind of stark demonstration of how um, US government is acting on behalf of oil companies and oil companies are acting on behalf of the US government. And it's not that the oil is actually reaching, um, uh, reaching the US. I mean, from the Jehan uh, terminal at the end of the pipeline, um, you can see a few tankers uh, perhaps arriving at uh, Richmond uh, refinery in uh, California or down, down in Louisiana, but, uh, but that's just a few of them. The important thing is that the oil arrives on the world market. Uh, US and uh, British and other Western companies have control over the oil and um, uh, the US has the geopolitical um, handle that it needs on the region. Um, but what, what this does at the same time is um, is support and finance uh, the government of Azerbaijan and its um, horrendous human rights record. Uh, a lot of the people that appear in the book, in the Azerbaijan part of the book, and uh, that we've worked with closely on it, um, have been uh, threatened, and particularly their children have been threatened with um, with arrest and with um, prison sentences and beatings uh, because of their political activity. Um, and when we, when we wrote the book, uh, we wrote it primarily to set the record straight on the, on the BTC pipeline. It used to be one of the world's most controversial industrial projects, um, and it slowly started getting forgotten once it got built. Uh, so we saw BP um, and the other companies controlling the history of the pipeline, the way it was being told uh, publicly after construction. So we wrote it to set the record straight and we wrote it to, as a testimony to uh, the people who live along the way and the people who resisted it. But what we see happening now uh, is that there's a whole new set of pipelines uh, being built over from the Caspian uh, to, uh, to Europe. It's known as the Southern Gas Corridor or otherwise as the Euro-Caspian Mega Pipeline, as we like to call it. Um, and what this new piece of infrastructure would do is once again, tie Azerbaijan and uh, the countries of the region um, to gas extraction, once again, reinforce uh, the dictatorial regimes that you see around the region, uh, tie them to this pipeline, and at the same time, tie Europe to another um, 30 or 40 years of gas supply and another 30 or 40 years of dependence on fossil fuels and uh, wrecking the climate. So what we see 
as our most important task, one of our most important tasks at the moment, is to make sure uh, that this dash for gas, this construction of uh, this new uh, set of pipelines to bring gas into Europe is stopped. Um, and where some of our, uh, some of our inspiration comes from in this is that uh, the movement along the way, the pro-democracy movements in Azerbaijan, people resisting repression, people resisting these fraudulent elections, people living alongside the pipeline in, uh, in Georgia and in Turkey, the Kurdish activists who are experiencing um, huge militarization due to, uh, in their region due to uh, the presence of the pipeline, um, and people along the way in Europe, and climate activists in the UK, and people fighting fuel poverty in the UK, they're all linking up, and that's where that's where we see our hope. Our hope is in linking up frontline communities, people fighting for climate justice, uh, people fighting for human rights, uh, linking them up to uh, stop this new set of gas roads and uh, to address climate justice and environmental justice um, at the same time. Um, and just to, just to, as a little visualization, uh, that is how we see um, this is what we call the carbon web. It's a very simplistic <laughs> diagram, but um, it shows how the operation of an oil company and the operation of a uh, pipeline can be supported by a whole web of different institutions, including, like I said, government, including uh, finance, both uh, public bank banks like the World Bank or European Bank of Reconstruction Development or uh, private banks. It is also supported by um, cultural institutions and universities that, um, uh, that an oil company might sponsor to create its um, social license to operate, something that May uh, mentioned. Um, and so to, um, to effectively stop the stronghold of um, oil companies on our futures and on our lives, we need to be able to break, one by one, break all these different links in the carbon web. Thank you, Anna. All right, Tim, go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I've been an enormous admirer of the work of 350.org in this country, of platform in the UK, and to be able to share a platform with, <laughs> <laughs> with you both is, is, is a great privilege and one of, the, one of the important things for me about writing this uh, book Carbon Democracy is the way I tried to um, tie together my own work as a, as a historian with, um, and political theorist with these uh, uh, contemporary political issues. I'll start off a little bit as a historian because um, uh, the, one of the interesting things about pipelines for me and in hearing about and discussing the, the contemporary politics of pipelines and the forms of contestation that they give rise to and, and, and enable <coughs> is that they were invented for exactly the opposite purpose. Um, the first oil pipelines were um, developed using wood tree trunks um, in western Pennsylvania in the 1860s because... Um, Rockefeller and other oil producers just getting the modern industry underway um, didn't like the demands of the Teamsters, the people who up till then were carrying the oil uh, using teams of horses, um, pulling horse-drawn um, ba barrels on wagons and the way to get around the labor demands of those whose, whose, whose labor was involved in moving the oil. The answer was to build a pipeline and you could uh, bypass that particular problem. And that is, is actually a small example of a much, much longer history, which is what this book Carbon Democracy tells about the ways in which um, the, the construction of energy networks have been organized around forms of democratic contestation and the ways of evading um, the kinds of challenges that um, people have been able to organize over the building of energy networks. And actually to understand these in relation to oil, I found it very helpful to go back and think about um, coal, which uh, uh, by the late 19th century, of course, was the dominant form of energy in the industrialized countries and played an absolutely central role in processes of democratization in countries that have become enormously dependent on oil and uh, on coal and therefore vulnerable in, a, in an unusual way. They were vulnerable because thanks to this dependence on a single energy source that was carried along very narrow conduits, essentially railway lines, going to docks, um, going to power stations, 
coming out of coal mines, that re relatively small groups of workers could link together and for the first time in history shut down a country's productive system, something that had never been possible in older, more distributed, more dispersed forms of energy production. Um, the form of that was a general strike, and it was out of the general strike from the 1890s through to the mid-20th century that in industrialized countries, um, populations were able to <coughs> Um, successfully achieve some of the basic transformations that democratized um, major parts of the world to achieve basic rights to, to livelihood, to um, retirement pensions, to accident and sickness insurance, to forms of national health care. All those things came out of the threat of uh, that, that, that organized workforces um, were able to put together for a brief period of a few decades, as I say. Um, that's an important way to understand the rise of oil, because the rise of oil was not just um, a second source of carbon energy. It was one that appeared to offer very different politics, and one can see that reading the documents, for example, of the Marshall Plan after World War II, and when U.S. planners interested in uh, rebuilding, helping to rebuild post-war Europe, um, were concerned, among other things, about this very power of organized workers in Europe and the kinds of uh, more radical d democracy they were demanding, for things like worker ownership of, of, of industry or worker share in the ownership of industry. And confronted with this power of the left in Europe, one of the things they argued for was, was to weaken those kinds of democratic forces by introducing an alternative source of energy, namely oil from the Middle East. And um, this was the way they would weaken the coal miners and their allies in, in, in other industries. <clears throat> and establish a more corporate, uh, less vulnerable form of, of, of political economy in Western Europe. Um, and they actually, the largest use of Marshall Plan funds was actually in subsidizing the transformation of Europe from coal to oil. Uh, so w the way one can think of that post-war period is um, like an early phase of, of, of a kind of um, <clears throat> uh, uh, deindustrialization, if you think, or, or, or an export of, of forms of production to another area of the world. We're familiar with that from the 1970s onwards, the moving of um, uh, manufacturing production to other parts of the world and the way that weakened possibilities for political organizing in previously industrialized countries. In a way, there was an earlier generation of that when, oil, when energy production, as it were, was offshored to the Middle East. So that the Middle East, thought of as this rather undemocratic uh, region of the world, actually has played a very central role in the democracy of the West because that offshoring of democratic struggles to the Middle East meant that uh, uh, an entire history of contestation over um, uh, forms of, 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 of popular rights and of popular political struggle was moved to another playing field, as it were, and incorporating a much broader population, but one that, because of the new distance that opened up, um, was much harder to link up with the political struggles going on, uh, continuing to go on, whether in Europe or North America. It's not that people in, in the Arab world, in oil-producing states, weren't involved in the same struggles. There were, and there's a long history of labor unions um, and popular movements organized with them in Iraq, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in the 1940s and 1950s and onwards, demanding basic rights, eight-hour days, the right to form labor unions, the right to a political constitution. These were all the, the arguments of the Saudi uh, labor movement in the 1950s and 1960s, for example. But oil was different from coal, and pipelines had a lot to do with that. It came out of the ground relatively easy compared to coal. You didn't have to send large numbers of workers down. Uh, you had a smaller workforce on the surface who could be easily managed, and then instead of putting it onto railroads, which could be fairly easily uh, disrupted by strike action, um, you, you put it into pipelines and pumped it uh, across enormous distances, typically to be loaded onto tankers, again by pumping rather than by manual labor, often in a different country. Um, oil from the Gulf being piped to the Mediterranean, much as the oil from the Caspian is pumped today to the Mediterranean. And then once it was on those tankers, again, uh, uh, much more insulated from forms of political protest because a tanker is at sea, it's not subject to any national jurisdiction or any forms of labor rights, and um, if political protest in one place makes it inconvenient for the tanker to go where it originally tended, it can be rerouted to another place. So those forms of flexibility meant that oil had this 
very significant role through the second half of the 20th century in particular in um, uh, not just making a democratic struggle different, di difficult, uh, much more difficult in places um, like the Middle East and the Arab world, but also in contributing to the weakening, to the de-democratizing of, of places in the West that had um, <clears throat> earlier used the vulnerability that carbon energy created to win unprecedented forms of political, social rights. Um, so that, uh, for me, that was a very useful way to sort of think about the politics of pipelines and the politics of energy in general, one that, just as I think um, in James's book that he was talking about, um, stays very close to the materiality of the fuel, um, the technical means of its transportation, the ways in which um, uh, different kinds of communities come into action with it, um, are, are, are presented with opportunities or create opportunities that are, that are organized partly out of the very equipment um, that, that energy relies on to move to be used and so on. Um, <clears throat> with that little historical story in mind, just a couple of thoughts about the present. Um, one thing one could say about um, pipelines today, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, and this is exactly, I, I, I think follows on with, from, from what Anna was saying about the, the big new um, uh, gas pipeline in, in Europe is the sense of being locked into an energy system um, uh, on an enormous scale because of the scale of the investment in these projects and because of the, uh, the, the long-term permanence of these forms of infrastructure so that um, uh, the kinds of decisions that are taken and also in relation to the extension of the Keystone Pipeline system. Uh, part of what's stake, I, at stake in these forms of infrastructural politics is, is that you are being locked in not only for the present but for the future uh, uh, over a considerable period of time, not years but decades. Um, and to the extent that that locking in is therefore um, removing or vastly circumscribing political opportunities for the future, not just for us, but those later on. There's a kind of de-democratizing work that is done um, in that kind of locking in to uh, forms of energy that um, are th so threatening to our collective futures. Um, but I think there are also, um, in ways I think we've heard about today, uh, these new forms of vulnerability um, it's not the old vulnerability of the coal systems that were subject to these forms of general strike, these unprecedented forms of political mobilization of the late 19th and early 20th or mid 20th century, but I think it's important to think about um, the way they do operate. And I've sort of learned a couple of things, both from listening to the other comments today and from thinking about it and um, following the politics of it. One thing of course, is compared to those, not just those pipelines that were built in the 1860s out of tree trunks, but even the enormous 12-inch pipelines of the 1940s, as they then were, the scale of, of this kind of infrastructural work is absolutely enormous. And that is uh, part, I think, of their vulnerability. And you see that even at this very local and tragic level of the size of the trenches that have to be dug and therefore of the, of the risks um, to local communities, um, that not only in the deaths of children, but um, in, in, in other much broader kinds of, 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 of risks to the entire lives of communities. And one sees that with, with the, the range of pipeline accidents in the US, and particularly the ones that have been associated with exactly the kind of um, uh, diluted bitumen that um, these, these uh, pipelines from the, from the tar fields of um, <coughs> of Alberta are bringing the very corrosive form of, of, um, of hydrocarbon that seems to be associated with much higher levels of pipeline failure and the failure of pipelines that are many, many times um, the, the diameter and volume of, uh, of the kinds of pipelines that earlier used to seem to provide some insulation from political process. So at the level of the impact on communities, at the level of the, um, the, the, the devastation that follows from these accidents, and at the level of the way in which they, because of the extraordinary scale of the investment they require, the 
size of the political subsidies, um, the subsidies from public funds that they depend on to get built in all these ways. Um, and, and, and one could extend to that, the, 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 therefore, out of this size, out of this gigantism, um, exactly as May said, the symbolic um, uh, dimension, the, the symbolic being directly related to um, those, those, those issues of size, the sheer quantities of energy that are being moved along them compared to earlier generations of pipeline systems. All those, I think, can be thought of as aspects of their, their vulnerability. Um, the, the other one, though, finally, which, again, my colleagues have, have talked about in different ways, and, um, uh, and I think the, the 350.org is now so directly and importantly focused on, is, um, is this question of, of the financial. Um, one of the books for those interested in these kinds of issues for more historical purpose that you may want to take a look at is a book called Railroaded by Richard Wright, um, who is a well-known leading American environmental historians with earlier histories of rivers and things like that, who wrote about the railroad boom of the U.S. in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and has completely rewritten what that history was about in ways that you can think of as analogous to pipeline projects today. Um, railways, of course, were portrayed as the great engineering marvels of their day, these, these things that um, uh, crossed continents, tied oceans together, promised to move uh, extraordinary quantities of goods. The trade of the Pacific would now reach the Atlantic, um, uh, and so on. Uh, they were also the great financial ventures of their day. Um, if you look at the list of corporations on the New York Stock Exchange in that period of the last two or three decades, 95 out of 100 corporations listed were railroad companies. That's what a stock exchange was. It was a way of selling shares in railroads. And that much was known, but what Richard Wright has done is shown that railways were not built to move people or goods across vast territories. They were built to move paper, that is to say, to, to, to move investments. To, they were set up, um, and often set up knowing, um, at least very early on, that they were not financial long-term financial propositions, but what they were things, they were ways of, of drawing speculative finance on an enormous scale in ways that could be presented as the future, as the necessity, as what America had to do as a continental power, um, in, in ways that, that turned out to be wrong, irrelevant, um, with no awareness of future, but also environmentally destructive on a huge scale because of the way they opened up um, the Western United States to environmentally destructive um, uh, industries and the way they destroyed Native American communities. Um, and, and, and as I say, of no particular financial use because uh, that wasn't what they were for. They were about selling investment um, to, to small-scale investors, large-scale speculators, and to people who made very large fees, those with privileged access into these um, businesses and um, in all kinds of ways, you know, selling on, arranging contracts to subcontracts to their own personally owned companies and so on, made fortunes out of the business. Um, so that sort of history of a period when the entire future seemed to rest on a single new technology that was going to transform the nature of collective life, um, rereading that as really a story of finance, um, uh, finance that depended on uh, on a smaller scale in those days, nevertheless, on, 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 on various forms of catastrophe, um, ecological catastrophe, the devastation and um, killing off of much of the remaining Native American population, the um, catastrophe of the series of the panics of 1870-whatever and the panic of 1890-whatever as each one of these railroad-based booms ended in collapse. I think, I think there are important lessons there for thinking about the oil industry today. Um, precisely because um, of this dependence on extraordinary levels of finance and precisely because, as James said, what oil has become, has always been, but is more and more evidently so, is, is not a way of providing us with energy. It, it's, it's a way of taking quite extraordinary levels of capital and returning it at even higher levels. And unfortunately, it's a way of doing that that involves destroying the possibility of future collective life in the process and the way in which we're caught up in those extraordinarily destructive 
um, circuits of capital return um, is, is so important. And of course, that's connected with the fact that um, the reason uh, we're having to, we're told we have to build pipelines to, to, to build a, to bring a particularly polluting and destructive form of oil from Canada or to undertake um, uh, drilling offshore in the Arctic uh, is, is, is because the oil industry itself is becoming ever more dependent on, on more and more risky forms of exploration and production and drilling and so whole set of reasons for that, the exhaustion, or, the, or at least the, the peaking of the conventional easily obtained oil, so that these companies that exist in order to take capital and go down in the ground with their drills and bring it out and circulate it through pipelines and bring it back are having to do that five kilometers on the, under the earth, deep offshore, uh, in, in dangerous waters with extraordinary polluting forms of oil. And all of that contributes to I think this ever-growing vulnerability of this process of reproducing capital that is exactly where um, the divestment campaign and similar initiatives are very rightly, I think, uh, uh, seeing the, 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 the point of vulnerability. So it may not be the vulnerabilities that railroad workers were able to exploit 100 years ago in very effective ways, but it is a matter of thinking in the same way about where are those points of vulnerability and understanding how to act upon them. Thank you. A round of applause for all of So now we're going to move into the discussion portion of the evening. And I'm going to start off with a question of my own, and then I have another one, and then we'll take your questions. Um, so you all spoke, and I did too, about the relationship between centralization and distribution, or as you said, at the core and the periphery and how that's changed over time, how it has such a profound political impact on confronting this industry. And I wanted to ask everybody to, to speak a little bit more about the contemporary context, because on the one hand, we have the renewable energy economy, which many of us view as an important part of the transition off of the status quo. One of the things that we often praise about it is its uh, decentralization that you can put a solar panel on every roof, you can have a small wind farm, all these things that don't rely on the big power plants. Um, but hearing you speak, I, I wanted, I'm really interested in your sense of um, both the pros and the cons of moving in that direction once again to being further um, disconnected from one another. And then the other thought I wanted to throw in here is, as you were speaking, Anna, you know, we have the carbon network that we want to dismantle then we have our carbon resistors network that we want to build up. So that's another component of this that I think is really interesting and they relate to each other. And I couldn't help but think about the internet because <laughs> here we are, it, talk about a bright new transformative technology that's supposed to save us all. Um, it, clearly there's tremendous potential to connect all these distributed activists on the one hand, that's 350.org would be impossible the way we conceive of it without the web. Um, on the other hand, when you contrast activists today and online with these popular movements you studied around coal, it's so different. So I wanted to, it's, I, I, having heard all of you speak, this is somewhat complex, but I'm not at all worried about you being able to explain how they all connect very clearly, but um, first question is on, yeah, this relationship between centralization and distribution as it relates to the politics of activism, but also the industry we're confronting. Whoever wants to start. Uh, I'd like to have a, a little crack at that, and, and it may be that, uh, I'll have a crack at the first one, which is about renewables. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, I think there's, you know, there's a lot talked about the, the disruptive nature of the technology of renewables, um, and I th personally, I think that um, it has that capacity, but it's not inherent in that in the capacity. Um, we've, at earlier times, worked on urban renewables projects in London, um, and it's very hard to do. <laughs> it's we've sweated hard at it, um, and I think it's very. It is. You know, there's immense challenges, particularly with the, the fact that we have metropolitan areas which are basically built on exactly the cheap coal that uh, 
um, Tim was talking about. London, for example, is built absolutely fundamentally on the cheap labor um, and cheap coal that was um, available in um, northern England and Wales and bits of Scotland. Um, and as a result, it's extremely uh, poorly insulated and so on. And changing that to a uh, high-efficiency, renewably-run city on a, dist on a, on a, uh, on a decentralised model is a real challenge. Now, it's not impos impossible, but it is a real challenge. I mean, and the other thing I'd say, just to give one example, is that um, we, we were very intrigued. Um, the book... The book um, ends in, in the, the journey that we take physically, about, although it ends in London, it actually sort of ends in, in Bavaria. And we were fascinated by a different, um, a different kind of pros project that was being suggested in Bavaria. Um, if you travel now on a train in Bavaria, remarkably, 80% of the fuel might come from wind and solar. 80% of a train. And this is like the most technologically advanced chunk of Europe. However, there's, a plan, there's been a plan for a long time to make an even more, um, bring in more renewables into the uh, German grid, and it's actually f proposed and financed by, particularly by Bavarian uh, financial institutions, such as Munich Ray, which is an insurance company, and Siemens, which is an engineering company. And that was a project called Desertec. Desertec was basically to stick very large solar panels in the northern in the deserts of uh, North, North Africa to generate uh, renewables and then run that electricity on a, on a, on a um, uh, high uh, quality electric um, cable which would curiously run very parallel to the pipeline that we followed over the Alps and into the grid, particularly in Germany. And, you know, sounds kind of good, sounds interesting. Uh, but the problem is, and, you know, from the zero to... Uh, from the carbon, merely carbon footprint. However, and it was being pushed very heavily in the, um, in the years before the Arab Spring. Indeed, literally six months before it was being pushed, um, Chancellor Merkel went to sign an agreement with uh, the head of Tunisia. And uh, indeed, there was a meeting with Gaddafi, uh, the head of um, uh, um, Libya. And uh, Mubarak was also brought into the project. And it looked like a bright, shining, um, you know, zero carbon uh, future. Unfortunately for President Merkel, which is probably Chancellor Merkel, it's a bit embarrassing that the very people that she'd signed up would then quickly be turned in the European imagination to, uh, how can I say, it's for you to describe what they're describing, <laughs> but, you know, the bad people, basically. Um, and, but what that neatly illustrates for us is the fact that you cannot divorce the technology, you cannot divorce the question of cl climate change from social justice. Because what that, the Desertec project looks to me like, looks to us like, is actually just a perfect replication of the, the oil um, system that Anna talked about when she illustrated you know, the, the pictures of, uh, uh, of Azerbaijan. Basically, you're re replicating that, but you're just doing it in a zero-carbon way or low-carbon way. And that doesn't sound like a good idea to us. <laughs> and so that's the problem, I think, with renewables on a mass scale like that. Uh, I think with, with renewables, and uh, the, there's a sort of easy tendency to sort of read off the source of energy, a, a, a political future. And, um, uh, fossil fuels are, um, by nature, lead to forms of centralization of power and of wealth and are therefore um, dangerous and undemocratic, and renewables must somehow be the opposite. And I think one's got to be careful of a kind of energy determinism. One, there were periods before the use of fossil fuels when the sources of energy were enormously widely distributed in rivers and fields and forests and so on. It didn't mean one had blossoming uh, forms of democratic politics. One had all kinds of local um, autocracies. Uh, and, I, and I think perhaps the term, the, it, it, the, the issue, the is not the question of how centralized or decentralized an energy system is, but at the levels of codependency it establishes. And, and that, that seems to me um, uh, something that can indeed be engineered at the level of, of energy systems, um, that one can think of ways of tying in, particularly with renewables, uh, the, the ways in which every building, every establishment, every household can become a generator of forms of of energy. You can establish not independence, not off-grid living, but forms of interdependence that um, 
uh, make people not just dependent but mutually vulnerable on one another. Uh, and it's that notion of vulnerability that, that, that um, more egalitarian, more, more, more just forms of politics arise out of situations of vulnerability, the vulnerability of the powerful or those in, in more privileged positions is, I think, the way to think about uh, questions of energy. And I, I, I think that also relates to the question of linkages and the internet, which was your other question. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a way in which the internet is a very bad model for thinking about networks because it's um, an idea of a, of, a, of a network that is based on nodes. Every point is a node and those nodes are kind of instantly connected with one another. And that's the wonderful thing and I agree completely. There's all kinds of very positive things um, uh, one can do with the internet while our messages are being tapped and listened into and so on. But um, uh, the focus is then on those nodes and their instant connection, whereas I think what one understands from the, the, the examples that, that James and Anna have been given is what matters is the connections, something you don't think about with the internet because they are so instant and automatic. It, it's not actually the nodes themselves that are necessarily important. It is um, what happens along the connections between, whether it's the pipeline routes or the, the movements of finance, and so that's a different way of thinking of the way in which things are networked or connected that isn't the kind of internet model of connectedness because it's actually how, how, the, how those connections are constructed, what goes into them, what's vulnerable in those connections that matters. I'm sitting here smiling because uh, Tim and James have just taken two, away two parts of my three-part answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but um, what I... Um, Maybe one thing that I wanted to uh, flag up is a question of political control. Um, one of the reasons that I, at the moment that the switch to renewables is so difficult is uh, and one of the one of kind of really common objections that you get to uh, to switching to renewables is but but, but they're not marketable. They they require so much subsidy. They uh, you need to put so much government money into um, into into these little companies to make them work. Well, hello, how much money are we putting into oil companies? Uh, that it, both in terms of the tax breaks, I'm sure you can look the figures up on that, but also in terms of um, you know having whole embassies in countries um, like Azerbaijan working on their behalf. And uh, one UK diplomat costs about three, three million pounds a year, I think. Um, and there are quite a few... UK and US embassies and consulates that work on behalf of all companies. And so if you start counting up um, the, all of this huge money, huge government money that's going into um, military subsidies, dipl diplomatic subsidies, as well as just plain old tax breaks, um, then the oil industry probably requires about as much subsidy to exist as a renewable energy system would. Uh, so, so that means that uh, getting getting away from oil and uh, getting into renewables means, um, again, sort of decoupling oil and government, and it means um, taking away the political control that oil companies have that allows them to uh, to use our centralized states, to, to cream off of them, to use their resources. Um, and yeah, so to do that, we need to link up, link up the movements, like May was saying, we need to create a carbon resistors web <laughs> that is that is as strong or even stronger than um, uh, than the carbon web that we have, and uh, uh, and to do that we need to create precisely like Tim says the kind of uh, really uh, strong and really strategic connections between uh, different movements along the oil and gas roads that that we have. Thanks, everyone. I'll hold on to my other question because I just looked at the time and. You may not want to talk about this all night, so let's <laughs> let's uh, hear a handful of questions from the audience. Go ahead and just speak up so we can all hear you. Have you done the math with regards to as far as what we use in energy, even if we were to use renewables, that still produces heat of, of some sort? And have you done the math as far as that? Even if you do renewables, you're still going to be creating other environmental externalities, um, one of those being heat. And I'm just wondering if you've done the math on that. Even if we're able to, let's say, do a 20% conversion, 30% conversion, even 100% conversion, you're still going to have that heat. 
you're stumping me. I already confess I'm not a math person. I'm not really a science person either. So what am I doing at an organization named after a carbon data point? Good question. Um, we have not done that particular math. I think there's a lot of good data about renewables and what that transition looks like and what it costs. And I think some of the places where you can get the data on individual countries and where they're investing, you can get from the Energy Information Agency. But in terms of a broader study, you all might know better than me in terms of their, their extra costs. Well, heat as a cost, I, yeah. You've, you've got me. I mean, again, that's a, uh, uh, maybe I'll pass it over to Tim. You'll go. Yeah, I, I'm the scientist, right? No. Um, uh, I, I can't really answer your question, but I would imagine it is negligible. Um, you know, the global warming is not caused because we're producing heat. It's caused because we're producing um, certain gases in the atmosphere that trap heat on a vast scale. So it, 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 it's not our generation of heat that's the issue uh, with climate change. Um, uh, many of the kinds of transitions involved in, um, uh, in, in the transition to um, renewables are, in any case, um, far less heat producing. Um, you know, an LED light bulb is not only switching from using 70 or 50 watts to using you know, 5 or 10 watts, it's also converting far more of that wattage into, into light than into heat compared to an incandescent bulb. So there's all kinds of ways that the very efficiency of these kinds of things is actually an efficiency that is producing more of the kind of energy you need. Um, the, 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 the insulation of uh, houses to burn less energy is, is, is conserving heat in all kinds of ways. So there's no reason to imagine that there's any heat um, consequences from switch to renewable energies. Thanks. Next question. Yes, I wonder if uh, we could, uh, you guys can weigh in on the issue of Venezuela and what Venezuela provides as a model for how we go forward in dealing with the issues around state and, and government and popular power and, and what we can learn from the Venezuela experience. Anna, do you want to start with us, that one? <laughs> Um, I don't think we have a, a Venezuela expert on the panel. Um, I mean, certainly, um, I was at a um, uh, at an event last night um, uh, organised by the uh, Energy Democracy Initiative, um, which is uh, based in uh, Cornell and which brings together different uh, trade unions uh, from across the world. So the people from Philippines, Argentina, um, India. Um, so on and, and the states as well um, and certainly there are a lot of people uh, in the trade union movement uh, and in socialist movements that are uh, proposing um, state control um, over over energy generation and over over um, oil extraction as a um, um, as a path to um, energy democracy having not been to Venezuela myself I can't um, I can't say how uh, how well it's working out for them. Um, another maybe maybe another place to uh, to point to that would be interesting is um, Ecuador and the uh, Yasuni Initiative, um, which is something that people might have heard of. Probably, yeah. Um, uh, Ecuador was going to um, was going to say that it would not extract oil that was uh, sitting underneath one of its uh, main um, uh, national parks. Uh, Isuni, um, also the home to a large indigenous population, um, they said that they, they were not going to extract that oil uh, in exchange for um, a bunch of European governments uh, getting together and uh, giving them some money uh, in return for the oil that they would not extract. Um, unfortunately, the uh, European governments have not coughed up the cash, and uh, so the, at the, as it stands at the moment, uh, Ecuador is not going ahead. Um, with with that initiative, but that is another uh, kind of interesting possible way forward. Do you want to add anything in, either of you? Um, again, not having myself been to Ecuador or followed closely enough um, uh, the way things have, uh, or, or Venezuela, um, 
I don't think I can usefully add to, to, to Anna's comments. I mean, I, the, the, there's been a general problem. I mean, again, drawing more on the region of the world I'm familiar with, uh, the Arab world and the Middle East, um, the way in which popular movements for forms of social justice um, that often were very strongly based in the oil industry and in oil workers were continually transformed into national struggles uh, and struggles around the nationalization of the resource. This is a context of, of, of there having been a, a sort of colonial situation as the um, a sort of late colonial situation as the oil industry came to being. So you see this very clearly, for example, um, in the case of Iran and the, the sort of most famous of, 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 of one of the oil nationalizations that by Mossadegh in 1951, the challenging BP, um, uh, and the showdown that led to the coup by the, organized by the CIA, CIA that removed him from power. But what's often forgotten about that is that conflict arose out of a workers' struggle, a wave of, of strikes in the oil industry um, to which liberal members of the Iranian landed um, ruling class responded by trying to turn this into a national struggle. Um, uh, rather than uh, give in to the, 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 the kinds of demands that the oil workers themselves were, were advancing, which were much broader than just the question of ownership of the industry. So that doesn't necessarily apply in any way directly to the Venezuelan case, but I think it's interesting to think about how nationalization itself um, has generally not been uh, a, a particularly useful situation. It might have improved things at a certain level, but it hasn't... Um, it hasn't been transformative. Thanks. One more question. Go ahead. Um, hi. I wanted to ask a question about the carbon web that you showed, and one of those aspects in the carbon web is finance. And you had mentioned uh, how within the finance section that these corporations are gaining social license from our education and cultural institutions. Um, 350.org mentioned the disinvestment program, and, and perhaps some of us are aware of the, the Liberate Tate uh, initiative. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the social license and what that actually means, why people should care about that, the efforts that you're aware of um, to combat that or that you may be involved in yourselves, and um, I'm also very interested in, in knowing how you can see the impact of those kind of counter actions to see are they really working. Thank you. Uh, thanks. That's a, you that's start, a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so it's. Um, I'm really glad that May first used the word uh, the word social license to operate. I think it's a. Uh, I think it's a very useful word, and it actually comes from the industry itself. It comes from uh, PR industry and uh, and. Uh, big extractive industries. Um, what that means is that oil companies at some point, uh, maybe around the 90s, uh, with, uh, with the Brent Spa disaster, with, uh, uh, with the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and uh, the Ogoni 9 in Nigeria and other scandals, oil companies stopped producing ads or uh, brought down the, the production of um, uh, TV ads and ads and magazines and so on that were targeted at people uh, saying, buy our petrol. And instead, uh, they started producing ads that are saying, uh, we're a good company. Um, they um, realized that they need to buy a social license to operate. That means uh, they want publics, particularly uh, elite liberal and conservative publics in, in big cities to think of them as uh, good corporate citizens, to think of them as uh, a good part of society. And that's why oil companies have, uh, when tobacco companies, uh, I don't know what, where it stands in the US, but in, in the UK, tobacco companies are actually banned from uh, sponsoring certain kinds of cultural institutions. So when tobacco stepped out and became unacceptable, oil stepped in. <laughs> Um, and you know something is interesting when that happens. Um, so, so oil companies picked up um, cultural sponsorship as one way of um, as one way of uh, purchasing that social license to operate and presenting themselves as good corporate citizens. So that when somebody hears about the BP spill or whatever it is, um, uh, the 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 Deepwater uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Uh, some part of their brain goes, but they sponsor the Natural History Museum. They're nice. Um, and yeah, so we as platform um, have been involved in um, 
in the UK, facilitating the creation of a, of a whole movement of different groups that are trying to break apart that link uh, between uh, BP and Shell and uh, different cultural institutions that they sponsor. We've been focusing on the Tate uh, specifically, which is a big uh, one, one of London's uh, largest museums. Um, there's other people focusing on the Royal uh, Shakespeare Festival and other things. Um, as as I've learned on this uh, on this tour, there are people who are thinking about doing uh, parallel sorts of campaigns in the U.S., uh, including um, there's a great article somewhere online um, proposing that the uh, that the new uh, what's it called the new Coke Hall of the uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York um, should, as as its first art exhibition, uh, display the mound of uh, petroleum coke that uh, that the Coke brothers, who sponsored the uh, this whole uh, deposit somewhere over in um, Detroit, and they should have this toxic mound sitting there for a little bit. Um, so, um, so this is a kind of growing moment, and our hope is that um, just as tobacco companies became unacceptable sponsors for cultural institutions in the 90s. The same is uh, going to happen to oil this decade. And I think where uh, the potential for success of this, these initiatives is, is in just how many artists that you know, themselves exhibit in the Tate and um, uh, theater figures and, and, and other people in the art world um, are now uh, joining that movement and also the success of the movement to get tobacco out of sponsorship back in the 90s is something that we take inspiration from. Um, I, could, I think there's something that's very interesting about the process which relates a bit, but about perhaps a bit to the question of what's the impact. Um, I remember there was a, a demonstration outside the Tate Britain, which was funded by, sponsored, partly sponsored by BP in, in, uh, in about 96. And it was held by uh, uh, the Columbus Solidarity Campaign. And what that campaign was trying to do was trying to capture the attention of people who were, you know, citizens, average liberal citizens going to the Tate Gallery and, uh, and trying to draw their attention, the citizens' attention, to what was happening in Colombia. And what, my, from my uh, understanding, what was happening there was that the Columbia Solidarity Campaign, you know, had observed the fact that it's extremely difficult to find a space in which you can interact with the general public about the question of BP. And they were using the fact that BP uh, sponsored this gallery as, as, a, as a way in which to define that space in which you could have that conversation, not about the gallery, but about Colombia. If you flash forward another, you know, 10 years or so, what you have in the <clears throat> actions of, say, Liberate Tate is something very different happening, which is the performances and pieces of direct action that take place and artworks that take place in the gallery space of the Tate, in the Tate Britain indeed, are asking a very different question. They're asking a question about that cultural institution, not about the impact of the company elsewhere, but asking something about the cultural institution and its relation to the corporation, which is, a very, is, is perhaps a subtle difference, but I think a very, very significant difference. Because what it does, I think, at the base level, it says, whereas perhaps the first one is saying, okay, so we've got this lots of oil in the world and we don't like what it's doing over here. The second one is saying, actually, we don't like this whole oil system. And we don't like the fact that it's supporting our cultural system. So I have a subtle shift, but very, very important shift in a period of maybe 10 years. Okay. And the other thing I would say about it is that, in the, of course, in the battle over sponsorship of the Tate, you get quite a lot of, we get quite a lot of flack back from some artists who say, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. Tate's good. Tate's great. You shouldn't, you know, you're questioning it. But very, very few artists this day and age actually go out to create work directly sponsored by the companies themselves. Um, Tim referred to uh, BP in Iran. Just before the nationalization, or just around about that point, there was a, a film which was produced by BP, a sort of promotional film about Iran. And the, and the script, the, the, the text of it was written by Dylan Thomas, 
which you wouldn't get today. In the, in the, in the late 60s, in, the, in the 67, um, a film was produced about the very pipeline that we studied going across the Alps. Um, and, uh, and it was produced by... Um, uh, it was the, the, script, the film was made by... Uh, I can't remember his name, but a very famous um, Italian... Um, filmmaker, whose name will come back to me in a moment, um, which again you would not get happening now. And I think that's a very, very interesting shift, a very subtle but interesting shift that's happening. Uh, uh, you, it's, it's sort of the tea leaves are something much bigger taking place, which relates a bit to what. So, I, the mic, what, the gentleman gave me the mic. My question kind of follows on the, the targeting of oil companies for the social license, but what about the banks themselves? Because the banks loan the money to make these companies, I mean, in any balance sheet of any company, the most enormous part of the capital is credit created by banks. And they kind of hide themselves, but we know in New York City, for example, from the stop shopping gospel choir in Reverend Billy that J.P. Morgan Chase is the funder of the mountaintop removal and the coal goes to Con Ed. So the lights here are coming from Con Ed. So, I mean, but the banks are hiding behind all this, but yet they are the enormous provider of the majority of the capital on the balance sheets for any corporation, not just oil companies. Some of the whistleblowers from media, for example, have said that they know, for example, NBC was threatened by the banks who sit on the boards to say, look, you've got to downshift this company and change the way you run this company and change the programming. La Follette, the senator from Wisconsin in 1910, around the time of that railroad time, did an enormous commission hearing, and he linked board seats to, to the J.P. Morgan Bank for thousands of companies around the United States. I mean, I just feel that the banking system and the nebulous web that it is also should be dismantled so that they can't do this anymore. And I just wanted to know how you maybe feel or target those kinds of things. Thank you. Before we hear the responses to that, I'm just looking at the time. I think after this, maybe we'll do short closings, and then there's more questions, and we can informally get those. So the banks, who wants to go at this one first? I, I can do it if you want. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, absolutely. There. Uh, they're on there too, um, on, on the carbon web. And, and that is all, those are also links that we want to break. Um, one interesting thing about um, uh, banks and how and their role in uh, expanding the frontiers of um, of fossil fuel extraction is that, um, say, 15 years ago, uh, oil companies quite often went to um, to private banks and to um, and to uh, international uh, public financial institutions as well for uh, project funding to bankroll particular projects. We, uh, for example, campaigned against um, bank loans being given to uh, the um, Sakhalin 2 oil field um, out in Far East Russia because it threatened um, it, it threatened to uh, destroy the livelihoods of um, indigenous people in Sakhalin as well as um, uh, also disrupting uh, migration of whales and various other problems. Um, that became really controversial. Several banks pulled out, um, and so now, actually, uh, controversial project, controversial projects like that are no longer, um, as a result of that campaign and and a whole host of other campaigns, um, quite often controversial projects are now uh, not using um, not using. Uh, directly project finance. So for example, Shell's um, so far failed, thankfully, Arctic exploration um, uh, up in Alaska um, is not using direct project finance. And that's, a, that's an odd kind of campaign success to live, to live with because it limits our ability to, um, to target uh, financial institutions and the link between them and oil companies. Uh, but we are always looking for new ways, and I mean, uh, the divestment movement is one way of uh, tackling, uh, tackling the financing of, um, of oil corporations, and uh, there's a host of others as well. And of course, we need to uh, keep, on, um, keep on tracking uh, where the finance comes from into Frontier Oil. I, I was uh, in Western Pennsylvania a few months ago in the center of the, the um, gas fracking um, industry in the, at least in the <coughs> eastern half of the U.S. And um, 
I found myself at the, sitting at the bar of the hotel in the evening after the event I was there for and um, next to two fracking engineers. And their topic of conversation was the takeover of their industry by the bankers. And the <laughs> line I liked that I quote in the afterward to the new paperback of Calm Democracy is a guy saying, you know, I was at the annual fracking conference in, in Houston. You know, he said, I, I was the only guy there not wearing cufflinks. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, th the particular way that translates in, into the industry is, of course, the short-termism, the risk, um, uh, all kinds of things that these guys clearly didn't approve of at all, um, and, and, and the sort of lack of experience uh, in, in the pushing of decisions. That was the engineer's perspective, but I think the larger story is indeed there's enormous involvement um, of, uh, of a mixture of, of banks, of, of forms of private equity, of the oil companies reinvesting their enormous surplus from the you know, current price of, uh, of oil um, altogether. And uh, there's been some very good reports on the way, the particular way in which banks uh, themselves, Citibank and others, um, uh, worked very hard to hype um, uh, the fracking of gas. And of course, as with the railroads of the 19th century, you know, they profit in both directions. Uh, enormous importing of capital, capital from abroad, from, from countries in the Gulf and elsewhere, into this boom. Um, uh, so, they, so they make the fees off that. <clears throat> And, um, and then when the whole thing collapses, and the price of gas did collapse from uh, eight dollars a million cubic feet back down to two or three, then there's the, the, the collapse of the companies, the mergers, the acquisitions, and they make money all over again off that. So it's, it's just like, uh, and it is indeed the replacement for um, the earlier forms of, of large financial speculation that all collapsed on them in 2008, so that instead of selling um, repackaged um, second mortgages, they were selling um, uh, uh, leases on, on, on land for fracking. And one of the statistics in one of the studies of this, which I wish I could quote the title of for you, it's, um, it, it's, it's, in the, it, it's, in, it's footnoted in the afterword of the paperback, um, it, 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 is that leasing land for, for oil and gas is now the largest single land use in the, in the U.S., in the, in the contiguous 48 states. Um, it's the larger than the amount um, planted in corn or any other single use. Um, it gives you a scale of the speculation that has flowed into uh, this kind of thing. And that's, that's the banks. They're the ones hyping and pushing that. Can I, I'd like to, first of all, I, I apologize for the fact that I forgot something earlier in the, my previous answer. The, the, the filmmaker was, interestingly, Bertolucci, who is generally considered to be a Marxist filmmaker. Um, he built, in 1967, he took, a, he took the paycheck from an oil company, an Italian oil company, made a film about oil. Again, I don't think you'd have that happening now, but I'll just, that's just to fill in that bit which I forgot. Um, <laughs> I think this point about uh, financialization is, uh, about banks is really, really interesting, and I'd like to just ex explore it for a moment in relation to the fact that it, it actually really <laughs> has real-life impacts. I think you could pin on that in this following story the death of at least uh, 26 people and the impact on the lives and health of hundreds and if not thousands of people. And let me explain the story as follows. Um, it's often considered, you know, we understand the fact that in the sort of late 70s and the early 80s, we, knew, we, we uh, moved into what might be called a new phase of capitalism, um, neoliberalism, Reaganomics, or financialized capitalism. And it tends to be described as something which is perpetrated by the corporations or banks or whatever on the rest of the world. However, when ten, we should understand also that it's perpetrated on the banks themselves or the corporations themselves. It's interesting to look, for example, at how BP, to take one particular instance, was affected by the process of financialized capitalism. In the late 70s, uh, uh, up until 1974, um, it was 68% owned by the B, by British government. It was a, effectively a state owned company, not run company, but owned company. Um, the IMF uh, requested as part of the um, bailing out of the UK in 1974 uh, th uh, that they should sell off BP. In the, when you, if, you, if you go forward to the, um, not, by the, it was sold off in chunks and was completely privatized by the end of the, by the mid 90s. But in the early, in the mid um, 80s, one of the most uh, important people in the company came, it was a guy called John Brown. John Brown 
um, was not an engineer. He was a financial uh, whiz. And he earned his uh, spurs in the company through creating um, some tax efficiencies, I think the technical word is, um, in the British North Sea. He saved the company a great deal of money. But he also set up a, a, a unit at the heart of the company called BP Finance, which was effectively the bank within the company. He then became head of the company in 1995, and he directed huge amounts of emphasis on trying to please the financiers, the banks and the investment companies that held its shares in the company. He absolutely focused on that, like a laser. For example, he did something which had never been done before, which he, he personally gave the quarterly results to, of the company to, to the bankers. It didn't, hadn't, never happened before. He presented them. He constantly carried favor with the financiers. And he did exactly what they wanted them, him to do, which was to, to uh, improve what was known as the return on um, capital employed. Um, and the way to do that, as he saw it, was to slash costs, to take labor costs and uh, expenses in terms of actually running units out of the um, company as much as possible. In the year 2000, he, he bought up, he was, he was pivotal in the acquisition and merger of a number of companies, one of which is Amoco, the largest American company uh, which was bought up by BP at the time. And in doing so, he acquired a whole set of assets. One of those assets was Texas City. Texas City was a prime site for slashing costs. Huge amounts of uh, labor were laid off. Safety was not, con uh, um, was not uh, uh, prioritized. And by 2005, the logical result of that happened on March 24, 2005, the refinery exploded. 15 people were killed instantly. And between 200 and 500 people were injured um, in, in many ways, both in the refinery and on the perimeter. But the process of slashing continued. And it is because of the slashing of costs that you had this particular company taking a risk, which the other companies probably wouldn't have taken on quite the same level with the deep water well and the Makondo well. And the, the pressure that was forced on the people running the rig to do the thing in, 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 in uh, reduced time at low cost meant that they took risks which other companies might not have taken. And the result of that is 11 guys died on the rig and many, many other people are still suffering the health impacts of the spill and the way in which it was apparently cleared up, the use of the Corexit. So you can directly relate to those deaths and those illnesses to what I would call the financialization of BP. Um, there's a whole other area which we could explore, which I think demonstrates precisely the vulnerability of the company. And actually, that whole process is, I would say, a herald of the end of the company, not in its strength, but its weakness, which relates a bit to what something that Tim was talking about. Um, but I'll leave that for another moment. <laughs> Great. Well, I think we've reached the point where we should do our closing remarks and save any other questions for, I'm sure folks have a little time to answer them afterwards. But um, thank you for your patience and attention. And who would like to close us out first? <laughs> Looking at me again, okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah well, um, yeah, first of all, again, thanks for everyone, for uh, everyone at uh, Verso and um, May and, uh, and Gary and everyone here um, uh, for making this possible. Um, uh, the only thing that I really would like to encourage everyone to think about is... Um, is supporting uh, communities at the front line of uh, of fossil fuel extraction as, as well as at the front line of uh, climate change. Uh, those of you who saw um, uh, Democracy Now! yesterday, apologies, I'm about to repeat myself, but um, uh, there's a community in um, Egypt on the uh, on in the Nile Delta um, that. Uh, that we that we've been working with uh, for, for the past year or so, and um, that has successfully fought off um, a BP gas plant being put on their doorstep. They organised, they um, you know they occupied uh, the space where BP was going to construct this this gas plant. They um, uh, they might have you know borrowed a couple of BP computers in the process, and um, uh, and they stole the construction for. Uh, a long enough time that BP said, okay, uh, that seems like we're not going to make money out of building here. We've got to move on. Um, and that's been really uh, an inspiring success. And that is something that's been achieved by 
you know, by by fishermen, by um, people whose uh, wh whose coastline is disappearing. The sea is washing out the Nile Delta um, as we speak due to due to climate change. Um, so looking to these people to me is the largest kind of uh, inspiration in uh, in trying to um, in trying to dismantle the power of the fossil fuel industry. And I think uh, when we think about how we organize, when we think about how how we analyze the politics of fossil fuel extraction. I think uh, people like these, people like uh, those who live on the along the coastline in uh, Louisiana, who were uh, were and still are affected by the Macondo spill. These people should be at the forefront of our minds when we think about these things. I'll just say again, thank you for, to to Cooney, to Gary, to to Verso, to um, uh, to to 350.org, to to my to my colleagues. Um, it, for me, it's been very illuminating to hear hear you again after after yesterday's uh, uh, run, and w wonderful to uh, be part of this conversation. Um, you know, there, there are proper activists, so I'm not going to uh, hear, I'm, I'm not going to echo or encourage along those lines. I, I presume some of you are also graduate students and thinking about how to do um, academic work on this. And I would say the, 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 the business of tying together histories of finance with, with histories of energy is one particular place where there's enormously important work to be done in, in, in thinking through that and in understanding the present uh, in, in new kinds of ways. So. That's the one form of activism. Um, thank, I, I will just repeat the thanks to everybody who helped set this up. It was great, very enjoyable. Uh, and I'd like to end on um, coming back to my favorite person, John Brown. Um, uh, <laughs> because I think it's interesting because, again, you can, through, through his career, you can also link up some of the other stuff that we talked about. John Brown is currently the chair of trustees of, uh, of the Tate Britain, of, of the Tate He's also on the board of the British Museum. He's also, um, he's also uh, was involved in to, uh, by the British government to create what was known as the Brown Review, which was to, to analyze how basically how you should uh, butcher the universities and particularly butcher the arts in the universities. Um, uh, that's a technical term, butchering. Um, and uh, finally, he's, he's the chairman of a, of a company called Quadrilla, which is a fracking company, which is fracking um, in, um, across the UK, because he's no longer chairman of BP. But what I find interesting about him, just finally, is that precisely the same time as he's stripping out costs out of the industry, he's pouring money into sponsorship of the arts. It's him who was absolutely pivotal in cutting the deal between himself and Nicholas Sorota, who's the head of the Tate, um, in a long-term uh, financial relationship between uh, uh, the company and the Tate. The first sponsorship was in 1990, and it's continued to roll on every year since. And it's probably got nothing to do with the fact that he's now on the board of the trade, Tate, or the chair of the Tate. Um, he's also was him who made sure that there was a BP sponsorship for the uh, British Museum, the Royal Opera House, the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, the Tate, um, the... Uh, uh, Na Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, and the uh, uh, National Maritime Museum. And I think it's interesting to me that precisely at the moment when you've got this company slimming down its actual focus on engineering, it's, as it were, its practical process of keeping this, what it does from blowing up. It's pouring money, a tiny fraction, really, of its overall things, but much more than it ever has done, into build, constructing that social license to operate and, and pouring it into the cultural domain. And in, indeed, doing exactly what uh, May referred to, which is the toxification of the political process through the petroleum industry. And it's, that reason, it's because of that story, I think, that I, I believe, very importantly, it's the detoxification that needs to take place, the stigmatization of the oil industry, that, that what 350 is doing is so important. If you understand the, counter, the, the shift that took place over the t last 20 years, in that process, through, illustrated through that example of that one person and his involvement with the company, you, you, we can understand why, how important and how vulnerable it is to, to tackle that, that area. Thank you. So finally, I'm going to close with two action steps. So everyone take out your notebooks and your iPhones and get ready. Um, so I heard back from our New York organizer. There is a divestment campaign at CUNY. 
Uh, the young woman who's running it is named Rose, and she works with the Responsible Endowments Coalition. So if you're interested in getting involved and you're a student, I hope this panel has illustrated the impact you could have. And so Rose is your person, and uh, she's pretty easy to find out, find online. So check her out, get involved here at CUNY. And then the second thing I want to announce is we just launched today um, a mobilization around the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, uh, which is coming up on October 27th. And a, there's a great assortment of groups, uh, mostly community-based groups, housing groups, called the Alliance for Just Rebuilding. Um, and that group and 350 and um, the Jobs with Justice chapter in New York are organizing a march through five different parts of the city that were most affected by the hurricane and then ending in City Hall. So that's going to be on the 27th at 4.30 uh, and that we're going to be meeting at City Hall. So we just announced it today, but um, it's a talk about an intersection of all these issues. We've seen this play out in our city, and so I encourage you all to... Uh, sign up for that and take part. Can I add an action point, please? <laughs> yes, <laughs> always. Um, on, um, on October the 19th, which is a little bit sooner, uh, there is something known as the Global Frackdown, uh, and that is a um, uh, an international day of action against fracking, and uh, the, uh, the New York bit of this is going to be happening at Chelsea Piers. Is that right? Um, uh, at 11 a.m. Um, and it's a, it's a demonstration that's going to take place outside of a um, celebration of New York food and wine. Um, and the governor will be there. And uh, the aim is to uh, to highlight the fact that New York's food and wine is uh, pretty dependent on, um, on New York's water on, and on New York's soil, uh, which might well get destroyed by fracking. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a nice evening. Thank you.